Jesus at this point is alive. It's resurrection morning. He's appearing uh, to his disciples um, and to the two on the road to Emmaus, the women first. Uh, he's gathering his own. The religious leaders have been given the witness of the Roman soldiers who've come back from the tomb and they've made their story with them. They're packed with them, say that the disciples stole them. Um, they made their, uh, their talking points. Uh, and they paid the soldiers off for the lie. Um, so you see the Lord just collecting people. Like I said, two on the road to Emmaus. He's appeared to Peter as well. So there's strange happenings. The disciples are having a hard time um, with all of this. They, they've heard that Jesus is alive, but he's different. He's not the same. He's able to conceal his identity and to reveal himself. He's able to, uh, he has abilities. He's able to appear and disappear. So he's popping up here and there, and they don't understand what's going on. They, they think that maybe there's a spirit. People are seeing things. They're not really sure. They've been told, uh, the women have been told by the angels, why do you seek the living among the dead? So they, they, they believe he's alive. The women have said he's alive. He's appeared to Peter, but the rest of the disciples haven't seen him yet. Now they watched him die. It says in John chapter 20, they're in the upper room for fear of the Jews. So they're in a room with the doors locked. So they're hiding away out. They're, if they've seen him crucified, they're afraid they're going to get crucified. So they're hiding in a room. They don't want to go out anywhere. They don't want to be caught. So they're, they're, they're terrified at this point. He's going to appear to them in this room, um, according to John 20. Now, all of this happens on the Feast of First Fruits. We went over this last week, that it's the 17th of Nisan, um, is the day of new beginnings. A church meets on this day. And as a matter of fact, this day is associated with a lot of uh, resurrections in the Bible, or resurrection, uh, I guess you could say, imagery. Um, on that day, the Feast of the First Fruits on Nisan 17, that's when Noah's Ark rested on Mount Ararat and the whole human race started over, basically resurrected from the ashes of the old world. You have a thousand years later, you have Moses parting the Red Sea, which is a picture of baptism, a resurrection there on the same day, 17th of Nisan. Uh, Forty years later, you have uh, Joshua coming into uh, the nation of Israel, the Promised Land, for the first time, parting the Jordan River, and they're enjoying the first fruits of Canaan the first time. And now you have Jesus Christ rising from the dead on the 17th of Nisan. Interesting as you go through. So he rose from that day, on that day, and it says in Matthew chapter 27, I believe verse 52, that he, uh, many of the Old Testament saints got out of the graves and they walked around. So in the first fruits, a lot of these Old Testament saints got up out of the grave and they appeared to many people in Jerusalem, which is pretty amazing. And if you go back and you look at history, uh, the Anti-Nicene Library, which is a collection of writings from people in the first century and stuff about what was going on, many of the, now it's non-canonical, which means that it's not in the Bible, but it's historical uh, literature, They'll tell you up to 10,000 people were witnessed rising from the dead around Jerusalem. So it's a crazy. So that, that corroborates that fact. Along with 1 Corinthians says this, 15, the Bible says this. So it's interesting as you read it. 1 Corinthians. Uh, let me see if I can find 1 Corinthians here. There we go. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3 says this. Paul speaking, for I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, that he was seen of Peter, then of the twelve. After that he was seen of about five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain alive unto this present day, but some are dead. After that he was seen of James, then of all the apostles, and last of all he was seen of me also as one born out of due time. So all of these happenings, the sun going out, the dead coming out of the graves, Jesus Christ appearing to people, all these people seeing him, over 500 at one time, the disciples, all of these things happening created a groundswell of belief. Even the, the, uh, the priests that put him to death, many of them are going to come to faith based upon these historical, these things that happened. And, and, and they couldn't deny it, that Jesus was the Messiah, that he was still alive. It's going to create that belief in Jesus Christ, which starts the church. It's going to start in Jerusalem. It's going to go to Judea, Samaria. They're going to get persecuted. Judea, Samaria, and then all the way to us today, thousands of years later. So these same fearful disciples, you got to realize, 
the, the claims that he made, they're all coming to light now. When the, when the gift of the Holy Spirit comes upon them, it's all going to become crystal clear that Jesus had to die. And Jesus is going to tell them that again. So all of this is created what we call today Christianity, you could say. But Christianity really is basically, it's, it's, it's the fulfillment of the Old Testament scriptures in presenting us the Savior, the Messiah that was promised to come from the beginning. And all of those who put their trust in this Messiah, because he died and rose again, will receive eternal life from Jesus Christ. And we, we, can, we can live forever with him. So, like I said, these disciples were, were totally fearful. They were totally afraid at this point. They're in the upper room. They're, the room's locked. They're afraid they're going to get crucified. They're hearing stories, but they don't, they, 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 they're, they're nowhere near. They haven't read the rest of the chapter. They don't know what's coming in the future. You know what I mean? So for them, it's all like mysterious at this point. You got to realize these guys are terrified for their lives, but they're all going to die for their faith because they've seen Jesus alive. You have to realize that. If Jesus if Jesus wasn't alive, we wouldn't even be here today. You would have never heard. He would have just been another imposter, another pretender. But Peter's going to get crucified upside down. Matthew's going to get killed in Ethiopia with a sword. John will be boiled in oil. He won't die. He will write the book of Revelation. James, a half-brother of Jesus, is going to be thrown off the temple and beat to death with clubs. Nathaniel's going to be flayed to death in Asia. Andrew's going to go to Greece. He's going to get crucified there. They're going to strap him to the cross. He's going to survive two days and preach from the cross, two to three days, according to uh, records. Thomas, no longer a doubter, he's going to go to India, and he's going to be speared to death there. Matthias is going to be stoned and beheaded. Paul is going to be beheaded. So they're willing to die for their faith in Jesus. So if Jesus was not resurrected, these disciples would have never died for a lie. The fact that these scared men died horrible deaths and never renounced their faith in Jesus, it speaks volumes. It speaks volumes to us because they're not going to make a phony religion as soon as they, they, if I knew it was a phony religion and somebody's going to kill me for it, I'm like, okay, I was just kidding. You're not going to like, okay, I'll die for this. They realized that there was more, that they've seen him alive, that he defeated death and they knew they were attached to him and they could defeat death as well. So this wasn't done in a corner either. You've got to realize the things that happened to Jesus were done on full display. Paul would say that. The Pharisees said these things weren't done in a quarter, corner. You know what happened. We, we mark our calendar on Jesus. Besides this, not only this, but early text reminds us of the courageous deaths of the early Christians, the martyrs that were taken into the Roman Colosseum. They died singing songs. To them, death was like graduation day. They welcomed it. The Romans were amazed at the way these people died. If you ever read Fox's Book of Martyrs, you'll just see one after the other just gives their life for Jesus. It, it, to them, it didn't matter. They, they knew where they were going. They had this no fear at all which is something that I think we should all aspire to. The closer we get to the Lord, the less I think we'll fear death. Like, I'm not fearing the process of death. Like, I've never done it before. It's kind of going to be new to me. So I'm not, like, I'm not like, looking forward to the actual feeling of it, but I, I'm not worried about the other side of it. Once I get through and I open that door, I, I plan on seeing my Lord and Savior face to face. So for me, there is a time to sing. Don't, don't cry for me. Once I'm gone, I'm happy. You can carry on. The building's yours too, by the way. Find another pastor, by the way, uh, <laughs> if I leave. Make sure he's good. You know, make him a little taller than me. I have my requests, you know, for, if you could. He, he, he's got a like to work out too, I think. We'll have to, but we'll have to, I'll have to write a little list of things I want for the new pastor to be if I, carry, if I leave here. The tombs and the catacombs, if you go below in Rome and the catacombs, their, their epitaphs say these types of things. He sleeps but lives. Here rests my flesh, but at the last day through Christ, I believe it will be raised from the dead. You read these, old, these first century people that died and, and they, have such, that they have such confidence, such confidence in Jesus and many more. The early church looked at death as a graduation day for them. The grave was only temporary the resurrection was central to what they believe in and it's central to what we believe in too i got you got to understand this what we believe in is a historical fact of resurrection which separates us from any other religious idea or any religious dogma or doctrine see muhammad's dead buddha's dead they're all people could have wrote all these things they could have said great things but they're dead they're dead prophets. They're dead people that none of them defeated the grave. None of them got up and left the grave. 
None of them were perfect and could pay for the sins of the world. None of them claimed to be God in the flesh. So what we believe in is a relationship with God through faith in the Son of God who loved himself and gave himself for us. And then that death on the cross purchased our pardon and gave us a righteousness we could never pay for. And when he rose from the dead, that was the receipt that we're going to rise from the dead too if we place our faith in Jesus Christ. No other religious figure could do that. And, and as a matter of fact, he stands alone. The hero of heroes and alone in all of history and alone in your calendar, Jesus Christ is uniquely the one and only Son of God who loved us and gave himself for us. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. He would say that to Martha. Though you were dead, yet shall you live. And if you live and believe in me, you will never die. That means if we die, we're still going to live. And there's going to be a group of people that live and are never going to die. That's the rapture. That's what we're praying for. Amen. But if we die... It, You'll, you'll absent from the body, he's present with the Lord. And then he would say, believest thou this? He is the resurrection and the life. It's, it's the question that you've got to answer for yourself. You have to believe that. Verse 36, we'll jump in. And as they thus spake, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and said unto them, Shalom. He just says, peace. Now, it's interesting, too, because he gives them peace. The first thing he says is peace. And the Bible says we now have peace with God, right, through what Jesus Christ has done for us. See, when mankind fell and sin entered into the world, we fell along with the sin. And we inherited a sin nature from Adam, the first, the first man. And in that sin nature, we were separated from God. And God can't look at sin, can't let sin into heaven. So we were alienated from God, basically. God had to withdraw from us because we were sinners. So we didn't have peace with God. We feel that God is there, but he doesn't like us. He's a little angry at us. And we, we, people try to placate and make up false religions. All types of things have gone on throughout the centuries. But the moment that our ancestors sinned, Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, God made skins for them and covered their, 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 their sin basically with a sacrifice. And then they introduced the lamb from the beginning. Without the shedding of blood, there can be no remission of sins, that there was blood that had to be shed to pay for our sins. And the blood that was shed on the cross was sufficient to pay for them. And now Jesus Christ can step into the midst of his disciples and he can say, peace. I'm going to give you peace. God is, you have peace with God now. He led captivity captive and gave good gifts to men, the Bible says in Ephesians. Wonderful things. Colossians 1.20 says, And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things to himself. Jesus also told us this, where two or three are gathered, he's what? He's, he's in this room right now. He's alive. There's a reality to it. He's walking in the midst of each one of us, testing our hearts, our minds, understanding the, the things that he can speak to us if you're open and say, Lord, speak to me by the power of your spirit. He can do that even this morning. He's in the midst right here, right now. If we realize this, I think, more fully, we would gather together more often. We would pray more often. How much do we not avail ourselves of prayer? You know, we come, we pray on Friday nights. Not a lot of people come. But we have opportunity here right now. You can pray right in your chair. You can pray with each other. I think it's important because Jesus is right here in the midst. And he was in the midst of those two thieves on the cross and one received them. Revelation 5, 6 says he's in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts and in the midst of the elders. It stood a lamb that was slain. Now when he appears in the room here, he doesn't conceal himself. It seems they know who he is right away. When he was on the road to Emmaus with the other two, he was able to conceal himself. But the one thing they recognized was when he broke the bread, I believe they saw the wounds in his hands. See, that's something he's never going to conceal. The wounds in his feet, the wounds on his head, he's always going to hold those wounds throughout eternity to remind each one of us and the love that God has for us. The Bible says in the ages to come, we'll be, we'll be recognizing and, and, and not, never fully comprehending the love that God has for us in Christ Jesus and what he's done for us on the cross. Verse 37, he says this, they were terrified and affrighted, and they think they saw a spirit. So first things first, they're, they're, they're terrified, they're scared. The door was shut. Everybody was wondering about the reports of Jesus appearing, and all of a sudden, poof, he appears. Does he just materialize? Does he walk through the wall? I don't know, but somehow he just, boom, he's there. Like Star Trek, I don't know, or did he walk through the wall? I would think he could just appear and disappear. Well, like, like 
He could sit right next to you. He could be here. Like Jesus, Jesus can be everywhere all at the same time. It's, it's just fascinating to me. But he can also localize himself. It's just amazing to me. So it freaks them out. It would freak us out too. They think he's a ghost. They can't believe their eyes. Verse 38. And he said unto them, why are you troubled? And why do thoughts arise in your heart? So where do thoughts come from? Our heart. That's why the Bible says to guard your heart with all diligence for out of it flow the issues of life. Don't give your heart away. If you're a young person, don't give your heart away too quickly. Hold on to that. Let the Lord, you know, let the Lord have your heart. And then you'll be able to give it away to, to the person that, that he wants for you. You know, I, I spent a lot of times with trouble, troubled heart because I, I, I didn't guard it when I was younger. Um, and you can get troubled thoughts. Why, why are you troubled? And why do thoughts arise in your hearts? It's important, man. For how the heart flow the issues of life, Jesus would say. So they're troubled. Thoughts are arising in their hearts. Is it real? I don't know if this is real or not. Behold, he says, look, my hands and my feet, that it is I myself, he says, handle me and see. Look at me. For a spirit hath not flesh and bones. So He's saying, look, I'm more than just spiritual. I have flesh and bones as well as you see me have. And when he had thus spoken, he showed them his hands and his feet. So it seems they're handling him. They have to go up to him to believe it's real. And they have to feel his wounds. They have to put their fingers in his side. They have to do all of that to make sure it's real. Now, who was the first disciple to, to, to do it? I don't know. They're standing there. I would have grabbed onto him. Don't you wish you could go back in time and do all this not knowing what we know now? It would be great. He was made known to the two on the road to Emmaus by the breaking of the bread. They saw his hands. And like I said, he's going to carry these wounds throughout eternity. And it was a reminder of what he went through for them. He's saying, look, touch me. You saw me go through this. These wounds are still here. A spirit does not have flesh and bone. Notice he doesn't say anything about blood. All of his blood was poured out. When you took a lamb to the temple, you had to sacrifice that lamb. You had to drain all that blood out of that lamb. That was a sacrifice. The Day of Atonement, the priests would do that for the nation with a lamb and Jesus his resurrection body has no blood it seems because he poured all his blood out on the cross Adam would say this when Adam was in the garden of Eden Eve was made he said this is bone of my bone and what flesh of my flesh he never said anything about blood did he I don't think blood was introduced until we fell until we sinned then we got a blood drive body I think we were clothed in light and I believe once we fell the blood came in and we were going to die. Dying you will die. We got these corruptible bodies that eventually wear out and die. And that's why the blood of Jesus was the only pure thing, the only pure blood that was ever on so that when his blood was shed and it was poured out on Calvary, that blood can cover our lives and we can be raised to a new life with him where we don't have blood drive anymore. We have spirit drive bodies. Yeah. What a wonderful thing. 1 Corinthians 15, 54 says this. He also said this, flesh and blood can what? not inherit the kingdom of God. Evidently, flesh and bone can. So we got this new body that he's, that he's appearing and disappearing with. 1 Corinthians 15, 45, 47 says this. The first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam, Jesus, was made a quickening spirit. Verse 47 of Corinthians 15. The first man is of the earth and earthy. The second man is the Lord from heaven. So the body that we receive, his body is outfitted to go to heaven, to, to, to travel between two realms. Anybody excited about that? You're looking at me like, this is new to you guys? You never read this stuff. Think about that. Don't you feel like you're missing something? Don't you feel like there's something like right outside of your observation that's really real and tangible, a place called heaven? You're born again by the Spirit of God. You long for that home, correct? See, now there's something in you that's stirred up for that place. Most people don't believe it exists. They spend their whole lives dulling the sense of the spiritual. And all their lives, they're frustrated. They go through jobs. They try to earn money. They do drugs. They do whatever they can to fill up a void in their life that's missing. It's called God. It's called spiritual life. It's called our home in heaven. Once you're born again, now you long for that place. You're spoiled for this world. It, it, this body that we're going to have is going to be outfitted so that we'll be able to do what we do here plus added dimension, which is the greater dimension, which is travel and and commune in a place that we've we know exists but we've never seen before and is greater than this place here imagine that 
His spirit in us will one day give us a body like his. Let me read Romans for you. Just so you know, I'm, as I start, I'm not making this stuff up. I look forward to this stuff. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you. Okay, Jesus was raised from the dead, correct? They saw him alive. The spirit that was operating the body that he was meeting them in, the one of flesh and bone, if that same spirit dwells in you, does that spirit dwell in you? You're born again by the spirit of God. If you're not, you're not of his. But if you are, then you will be raised up. That raised up Christ from the dead shall also make alive these mortal bodies, this body right here, by his spirit that dwells in you. It is going to be made alive again by the spirit, the seed that is in me. He would say the word of God is seed, correct? And if that word of God falls into a heart that's fertile, it will produce fruit, correct? Now you have the seed, the spirit of God. You're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. That seed will one day burst into new life. Because it's placed inside of you. Verse, verse 14, same chapter. For as many as are led by the Spirit, they are the sons and the daughters of God. Now we have a new nature in us that longs for home, and we walk in the light as He is in the light, and we're led by His Spirit. We've not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. We're not afraid of dying, but we receive the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba. We, ca we call God Dad, Father. The Spirit itself is in our hearts. So how do I know I'm saved? I know that I know that I know. Why? Because I'm born again by the Spirit of God and it testifies in my spirit that I belong to God. And that's why I live my life the way I do because I know there's somebody out there. Like, the moment I got saved, I can no longer live the way I used to live. There was something different about me. I live a life of repentance now. I realize that this flesh in me dwells no good thing. So I want to feed the what? Spirit, correct? I want to walk in the spirit and I want to put to death the deeds of the flesh. Only a believer would understand that last statement I just made. But the spirit itself bears witness to me that I belong to God, that we are the children of God. And if we're children, it says we're heirs. We're heirs of God. We're joint heirs with Jesus. Jesus owns everything. By him, for him, and through him was everything made. Not anything was made that was not made by him, for him, and through him. And all those things that are made belong to us now as well. Isn't that incredible to you? If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. So while we live on this earth, how do we suffer? We suffer because we have a treasure that's groaning for heaven, living in these earthly bodies, and we're angry at this earthly body for love and sin. Or is that just me? That's how we suffer. Once you're born again by the Spirit of God, you're suffering in this world because you know what you want to be and you're stuck in this body of sin and death. It says when you see the things that the Bible predicts beginning to happen, lift up your head and look up because your redemption is drawing nigh. You're going to be redeemed and completed. Who's longing to be completed? Who likes the situation the way it is right now? I don't. I don't like the fact that I still... Sin. I don't like the fact that there's things in my life that aren't 100% Christ-like at this moment. But they will be. But they will be, and my heart longs for that. So we're suffering here until glory is revealed into us. We're going to be glorified together with Him and have the same body. That's exciting. Verse 41. And while they yet believed, so they thought He was a ghost and they didn't believe. Now they can't believe because it's too good to be true. Isn't that just like us? We're not happy no matter what. Okay, we felt him. He's real, but it can't be. <laughs> this is too great. I get, can I, I, first I would ask is, can I get one of those bodies? First thing I would have said, Jesus, you can do anything. Give me one now. And he would probably say, you have a lot that you don't know, not of, you know, to me. And wondered, he said, and their, their, their joy and their wondering, because it is blowing their minds. They had never understood being raised out from among the dead. Ek, ek, necron. He said that on the way down from the Mount of Transfiguration. You won't understand these things until the Son of Man is raised out from among the dead. They've never heard that concept before. He's raised out from among the dead. He has a new body and, and his flesh and bone and he's able to appear and disappear. He's able to eat and not get fat. It's just amazing. So they're wondering and they're saying, this is too good to be true. And he says, while they yet believe not for joy and wondered, he said to them, have you here any meat? So he says, look, give me something to eat. And they gave him a piece of broiled fish and honeycomb. So I like Jesus' choice here. The fish is, is okay, but the honey makes it taste a lot better. So broiled fish and honeycomb. And he took it and he ate it before them. So what's he doing? He's demonstrating to them the reality of resurrection, that it's real. This is not a phantom. We believe in something tangible, something real. He can eat. 
I'm the same personality. I'm the same guy you guys knew before what happened, before I died. And I'm raised now to, to handle me, feel me. I'm hung. Give me something to eat. I'll eat for you just to show you that it's real. So people ask questions all the time. What's our resurrection body going to be like? What's it going to be like in heaven? Is it going to be boring? Are we just going to sit on clouds and play harps all day? What's going to happen in heaven? What will our resurrected bodies be like? You know, will we know one another? Will we know our husband and wife? Will I get hungry, cold, lonely? All those things that we wonder about. Will we remember everything that happened here? Well, Philippians 3.20 says this. Our citizenship is where? In heaven, from which we also eagerly, we're eagerly awaiting this, are we? Waiting for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly bodies. So our bodies will be transformed, and what we're going to get is not going to be inferior to what we, what we have now. Evidently, here's what we do know about from the New Testament accounts about his body, our future. That he was tangible. We're going to be able to touch each other. We're going to be able to hug each other. We're going to be able to experience touch, taste, smell, senses, eyes. We're going to remember everybody and everything that happened to a greater degree than we do now. We're going to be able to eat and drink. And evidently, we're all going to be 33 years old. Who's happy about that? Some people are like, <laughs> some people ain't 33 yet. And they're like, no, I like 26 and I'll stay here. <laughs> First service was ecstatic about it. Trust me. <laughs> I'm happy. 33 is good for me, man. I'm, I'm, I would love that. So you're going to eat, never get fat. That's the diet I'm looking for right now. You can taste, you can feel, you can smell, you can touch, you can recognize. You can also withhold your recognition from other people like angels. Or The Bible says people entertain angels unaware. We're going to be an equal to might and power of Jesus, that is the angels. But we're not going to need to procreate like the, angel, like the angels don't do that either. So we're going to have power, but we're going to be the sons and daughters of God. The special creation of God throughout eternity. One of the reasons why Satan hates us so much. So we're going to be able to withhold our appearance if we deem it necessary, which would be kind of fun for me because I'm planning on sneaking up on Charm a lot in eternity, <laughs> asking her how she felt about her husband that God gave her here. Oh, tell me about, you know, your life on earth. You know, maybe she won't know who I am. <laughs> Find out how she really thinks. I'm sorry. Um, we're going to judge the angels, the Bible says. So we have separate destiny from the angels. We're going to judge the angels that, that sin. Now, see, we're on this ball of dirt right now as, as sinners saved by grace. And the spiritual realm is basically hidden from us in a lot of ways. We can sense it. We see through a glass, the Bible says, darkly. And we connect with it through prayer. We connect with God through prayer. Now, there's angels and principalities and powers that, that, that rule the darkness of this world at this present time. And their job is to blind the minds of unbelievers so that they can't see the gospel. And they'll do it with drugs, they'll do it with phony religion, they'll do it with anything they can do to blind your mind to the fact that God loves you and sent his only son to die for you on the cross. They'll make fun of it in every TV show and every pop culture thing that you get. Christianity will be ridiculed and every other religion will be vaunted as a, as a viable option. And Christians are right-wing, lunatic, crazy people who hate you. That's a total lie. We love people. We love all people. There's not a racist bone in a true Christian's body. There should not be. Or they ain't a Christian. Because Jesus says he's going to call every tribe, kindred, nation, and tongue. So these nations, these, 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 these people around the world, they have a, an understanding of God. They have a conscience. But those consciences are seared. And it's helped by this fallen realm. This fallen realm that keeps us subjected. And if you live on this earth, everybody that's born on this earth, every human being that's ever walked on this earth has a choice. To either trust God and trust his son Christ or to be separated from the Lord. And there's a battle going on for souls. And there's angelic principalities and powers. The job of the church is to fight against those principalities. And, and wake them up to the, to the idea of reality. That's our job as believers. We have that light. We need to shine that light to people. But these angels are going to be judged. They're going to be judged by us because of the great advantage that they had. Everything on this earth is basically designed to try to turn you away from the truth. But one day, Christ will come back. He will rule and reign. And the knowledge of the Lord will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. We're supposed to be the salt and light of the earth. That's the only reason why judgment has not happened yet is because we're here. And our job is to continue to spread that. It's going to be great, though, when we get our new bodies. Amen? 
That we're going we're gonna to have some of their abilities. We're created in the image and likeness of God. That we're going to be incorruptible. We're never going to wear out. We'll be human in appearance, but space and matter won't hinder us. I like that already. I'm planning on maybe squatting a planet or something. I don't know. Um, <laughs> We're going to recognize each other. The disciples recognized Moses and Elijah when they came down from the Mount of Transfiguration without any introduction, without any photographs. They knew who they were. You're going to know people instantly. Now, when it comes to marriage, God, God gave Adam the gift of marriage before the fall. Um, but it says that we won't need to marry in heaven. We won't procreate. But our relationships with one another will be greater. There will be a spiritual dimension that we have that will be greater than any physical relationship that we've ever had. There will be a spiritual dimension that we've lacked. We'll understand people to a greater degree. And also, we'll, uh, you'll always be the same character you are now. That means I'm always going to be Matt. Elijah's always going to be Elijah. Moses is always going to be Moses, and you're going to know him. Noah's going to be Noah. So what character are you building for eternity? What are you going to be known as? What kind of Christian are you going to be? Are you going to have an abundant inheritance into heaven, or are you just going to barely get in? I want people, to, I want people when I get to heaven, I first, when I first got saved, I was like, just let me in the, the gate. Just give me the blanket. Just, I don't want to go to hell. Just, you know, I'll sit right outside the gate. I don't care. Uh, bombs for the poor. I don't care. I just want to go to heaven. Now, the longer I walk with the Lord, I want an abundant inheritance of heaven. My treasure wants, you know, where your heart is, that's where your treasure will be. Are you longing for his appearing? Do you want that day to happen? Do you want to lay treasure ahead? Is that important to you? So what eternal rewards are you building? Are you waiting for the appearing of, of, of Christ? Are you walking in the spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, all those things above which the Bible says there is no law? Are you keeping eternity in view in your character and personality because you're going to carry that into heaven with you? So it's important to me, and I hope it's important to you. Now, a lot of people think that's science fiction, what we believe in. Even theologians today try to explain away the resurrection. It was like a spiritual or ethereal type of deal. It was physical. Jesus Christ physically rose from the grave. You could touch him. You could handle him. Paul answers those critics in, in 1 Corinthians 15. I want to go there real quick for you if you'll go there with me. Just turn there if you can. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 35 says this. Let me read it for you. Some man will say, how are the dead raised up and with what body do they come? How, what kind of body do you get? Paul's going to take us to nature here. Verse 36, thou fool, that which thou sowest is not made alive except it dies. And that which thou sowest, thou sowest not that body that shall be. So when you sow a seed, you're not sowing uh, a corn, it comes up as corn. You're not sowing, you're sowing a seed, it comes up as a pear. You know, you're sowing a seed, it comes up as a grape. But bare grain, that's the seed. It could be wheat, it could be any other form of grain. But God giveth it a body as it hath pleased him, and to every seed... His own body. So he says, let's go to nature. You put a seed in the ground, it dies, it comes back to life again. It's not the same seed you planted. The plant that comes from that seed is a miracle. It's the same with the resurrection. Verse 42, same chapter. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. This body dies, it's corruption. It is raised in incorruption. That means you, 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 it's not going to wear out. The second law of thermodynamics is not going to apply to what is raised to new life because the seed that is in me now. Amen? It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. This body of flesh dishonors itself, but it's going to be raised in a glorified body. It is sown in weakness. In my flesh dwells no good thing, Paul would say. It's weak. It'll be raised in power. I will always want what God wants in this new body. I can't wait for it. It is sown a natural body. The natural man doesn't care for the things of God, but is raised a spiritual body. It longs for the things of God. There is a natural body, there is a spiritual body, and so it is written. The first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Jesus, before he died, had a physical earthly body. After his resurrection, he had a spiritual body along with the flesh and bone that he had. The limitations of the physical body no longer applied to the body that he had when he rose from the dead. He could do all those marvelous things, and yet it was still a body. 
A body fitted for the heavenly reaches. A body fitted to operate in, in two places. It, I get, get that? I, I can't do it justice. Just imagine, imagine being complete. Put it this way. If you lived your whole life in a cell, a 10 by 10 cell, that's all you knew. You'd be happy with that 10 by 10 cell. You would think it was pretty big until somebody took you outside and you saw the whole thing. You'd be like, oh my goodness. You're living in a 10 by 10 cell here on earth. You do not realize the potential that you have. You do not realize the spiritual gifts that God has awaiting for you. The Bible says, eye has not seen, ear has not heard, neither has entered into the heart or the mind of man the things that God's prepared for those that love him, but by his spirit, he reveals them unto you. So if his spirit dwells within you, you can't articulate what exactly you're looking forward to, but when you read stuff like this, you go, oh, you can't handle it. That's just me. I can't wait for this stuff, man. I, I, oh, I want to blast off when I read these things. <laughs> he's getting them accustomed. See, the limitations aren't applying, so he's saying, look, I'm here. Even though you can't see me, I'm still here. I want you to practice my presence. Jesus Christ is in the room. How many stupid things would I have not done if I realized Jesus Christ was standing right next to me? Huh? But we, we set them aside. When we want to do what we want to do, we put Jesus over here. I'm going to go do this, Jesus. I'll be back to pick you up in a minute. He never leaves us or forsakes us. He sees everything. He sees every motive. He sees everything we do in the dark. And character is what a man or woman does in the dark. When you think nobody's watching, well, guess who's still watching? Jesus. He's there. And character is the character you're going to carry is what you do in the private moments. When you have the ability to say no, and when you do, and when you fail, you get on your knees and you go straight to Christ. He's getting them accustomed to the fact that he's always here in our midst. Even if he's not visible to the eye, he's still present. He's still available. Jesus would say to Thomas, because you've seen me, you believe. Blessed are those that don't see me and they believe. Blessed are, they're blessed. That's the majority of us. Verse 44. And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was wet, yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled. Remember, guys, remember what I said to you about the fulfillment of Scripture, which were written in the law of Moses. He takes them to the Old Testament. These guys are going to write the New Testament. So he takes him to the Old Testament. He says, the law of Moses, the Torah talks about me. The prophets talk about me. The Psalms, which are the wisdom literature. Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. All these things concern me. Then he opened he their understanding, it literally says he untangled their minds, that they might understand the scripture. So he points them to the scripture. They got Jesus, God in the flesh, resurrected form, with wounds in his hands and his feet, speaking to them, and he's saying, let me take you to the Bible. Let me take you to the word of God, because the word of God lives and abides forever. I told you these things before. Let me untangle your minds and show you in the scripture what happened to me and why it had to happen to me. So he points to the word of God to authenticate anything. Any spiritual experience that you have has to be authenticated by the word of God. Do not come to me with a spiritual experience that I can't authenticate with the word of God, because I'm going to tell you to get out of my face, kindly. I'm just saying that here for effect. I'll say, I, I can't receive it. If I can't quantify it with biblical truth, you could tell me anything. That's how people go to Jonestown, Guyana and drink Kool-Aid. That's not what we're doing. He's taking them to the scripture and he's standing there resurrected. He takes them to the scripture. How important is the word of God? That's why we go through it verse by verse. We have such a great privilege to come here and read the Bible line by line. We can forego all the formalities, come in here, and we can open up the scripture, and we can read it verse by verse, and you guys know I am leading you verse by verse through the Bible. I'm not deviating. The word of God will be fulfilled. The three divisions of scripture all speak of the Messiah, all speak of who he is. The prophets, the Psalms. He says, Dianojo in the Greek, I'm going to thoroughly open up your mind. And the disciples always had a hard time before the cross, about the cross. Remember, he says, I got to go die. They're like, no, we don't want that. We, we interpret the scripture this way. You're just supposed to set up a kingdom. We don't want none of that dying stuff. 
It was hidden from them, it says in Luke chapter 9. They were afraid to ask him about it. Acts 1, 3, it says, To whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, seen of them 40 days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom. So for 40 days he spoke to them of the things of the kingdom of God. How important is the New Testament to you? Because everything those guys wrote in the New Testament are about the kingdom of God. Every prophetic piece of literature that Paul wrote, that Peter wrote, that John wrote in the book of Revelation will be fulfilled literally. He spoke to them about these things. And they wrote it down. All things must be fulfilled. So the blinders are off and the word starts to come alive to them. When the Holy Spirit falls on Pentecost, they're filled. All things become clear to them. He said, look, you guys won't understand this until the Son of Man is raised out from among the dead. Now he's standing in front of them, untangling their minds. All the things concerning him will be fulfilled, which tells you something else, too. That means the Antichrist will come. That means Jesus Christ will destroy the Antichrist with the brightness of his coming. It means Jesus Christ will put his foot down on the Mount of Olives, split it in two, walk through the Kidron Valley, walk into a temple, a rebuilt temple, claim it for his own, and rule the world for a thousand years from that location. That's going to happen. Jesus Christ is going to, with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and trumpet of God, the dead in Christ will be raised, and we who are alive remain will be caught up to meet him in the air before those events start to take off. You believe these things? He told them about it. Imagine what he said. He, he went to Isaiah, probably, Isaiah 53. I had to be numbered with the transgressors. I had to be beaten and bruised for your iniquities. The chastisement of your peace was upon me. By my stripes you were healed. Isaiah 55, the great, one of the great, great salvation chapters in all the Bible. Come unto me, anyone who is thirsty, come, drink. Then you have no money, come buy, eat. I'll give it to you for free. I delight in mercy. Let the wicked man forsake his way and the unjust man his thoughts, and I will abundantly pardon him. I'll freely forgive. Well, he's taking him through the scripture, Psalm 22. Let's talk about that. It says they, they gamble for my clothes. You guys saw that go down, didn't you? Let me untangle your mind about this. Jesus opened up their minds. I pray he opens up your mind. Verse 46, and he said unto them, thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. Underline this verse is so important. Verse 47, what's our mission? This is our mission right here. That repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem and you are witnesses of these things. So Jerusalem is where it's supposed to start. Interesting too, they're the guiltiest city on earth at this point. They put to death God just a few days ago and he's saying, let's start the grace of God here in that city. And Peter will preach and thousands will come to know the Lord. Some of those priests that consented to put Jesus on the cross through all the witnesses of that day, the sun going out, the veil being torn, the, the veil in the temple being rent in twain, the graves being opened, uh, the reports of Jesus, 400 people, 500 people singing at one time, all that stuff is going to convince all them to get saved. There's going to be a groundswell of belief. They would have stayed in Jerusalem in the early church. They would have not moved if it wasn't for persecution. They would have stayed right there. But God pushed them all the way out to Antioch, around to the world, to us today. What are the two things that they're supposed to do? He says, you're going to be my witnesses both in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and uttermost parts of the earth. The two essential things we're supposed to tell others about Jesus Christ. The number one thing is what? Repentance. It's lost on people today. What does repentance mean? Repentance comes from the Greek word metanoia. It means to change your mind. It means to do a 180. You're heading this way, and you need to head to the Lord. Repentance is, your, is, 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 is something man does to agree with God and his word. What does agree with God mean? It comes from another Greek word called homologeo. It means to say the same thing that God says about sin. Do not call yourself a Christian and you can't admit what biblical sin is. If you in the womb is okay with God, then you do not know God and you are not repentant. It's as simple as that. If you want to say marriage is between a man and a man or a woman and a woman, you do not know God, neither do you know the scriptures, and you haven't repented because God would call that sin. And that sin is what put Jesus on the cross. When I got saved, I participated in premarital sex. I participated in drugs and alcohol. I, I, I wasn't a good person. 
by any standard of, of, of even an unbeliever would probably say, eh, I was shady. When I got saved, I agreed with God that all those things were wrong in my life. And every single one of them I needed to be delivered from. And I would never say that they're okay. And I will never say that they're good. What I'm going to do is I'm going to fight against that nature. That was the old man is put to death. I want to live for the new man now. The seed that is placed within me now wants to long for eternal life. So I put to death those things that are in the past. And I realize that I live in a body of flesh. I live a life of repentance. Let me say that again. I live a life of repentance. Why? Because I'm constantly drawn aside to do something wrong. Let me give you an example. When I pull up a giant and I go into the, the checkout lane that says 20 or less items and the person in front of me has 60, I'm mad at that person. <laughs> and I'm not a pastor. I'm saying, you, you, you're a fraud. Get out of this line and get in the other line. But I try to hold my tongue. Why? Because I am a selfish person. I have things I want to do. I am not thinking about that person as, a, as, as the needs to get saved. I am being selfish. Then I have to repent and say, Lord, forgive me. I'm not supposed to be thinking like that. Even though they did get in the line with 50 <laughs> things. And then you know they're going to pull out the coupons too. And they're going to be there for another half hour. And then they want to pay with a check. And then they got to check the, the... And the long lines are getting out before you. So i got to live a life of repentance. You drive by a billboard and you see a, a half-naked woman. And you're like, why do we look? Because there's something in us. It's called the sin nature we inherited from Adam. It's in us. So I have to constantly say, Lord, forgive me. Lord, make me more like you. We continually were saying, so repentance is what gets you in the door. And then you stay in that mode. As you found Christ, you walk in Christ. Because you're not going to be perfect until you get your new body. So don't tell me I've repented. Yeah, but, I, but, but I'm okay with murdering a baby in the womb. Or I'm okay with the way Mar we fly the rainbow flag. Do whatever you want. Because there's going to be a lot of people at that day that say, Lord, Lord, didn't we do this in your name? Didn't we do that in your name? You just say, depart from me, I never knew you. Because they never really repented. Amen. They belong to this world. They're not of the other stuff that we're of. If you're born again, you belong to another world. Where the kingdom of God reigns in your heart. His rules, you want them to come to earth. On earth as it is where? So where do you get that from? A repentant heart. It ha everybody has to repent. It's not endemic to just, it's every single person. We need to repent. Our nation needs to repent. And then once you repent, where do you, where, where do you, what do you get? You get remission of sins. This is the beauty of it. So you say, God, you're right. I'm wrong. Man, I got nothing. I'm, I'm, I, I'm bankrupt. I'm sold in sin. Thank you for waking me up. Thank you for sending your spirit to wake me up to these things. Forgive me. Cleanse me. Fill me with your spirit. I want to live for you. And then you start that journey of, of battling where you put on the armor of God. But what does Jesus say? At that very moment, he sends his spirit to you. He seals you with the Holy Spirit of promise. And your sins are what? Remitted. That means they're sent away. They're sent away forever. Dismissed. Who likes that word? That means when I die, all the sins I did, and I did many when I was younger, they're gone. They're not even going to be remembered. He's not even going to see my sin. He sees Christ in me. Now, all of my sin was placed on Jesus, and now all of Jesus' righteousness is placed on me. So when I get to heaven, God's not going to judge my sin because it was already been judged on the cross by Jesus Christ. He's going to let me in because he sees the righteousness of Christ in me. Amen. So my sins are sent away, and I agree with God, and I live a life of agreement with God, and you should as well. That's what we preach, those two things. Verse 49, you got to get it straight. There's a lot of people running around saying a prayer but never really repented. The church is filled with people like that. I mean, my daughter goes to camp. It's a Christian camp, and people are wondering if bisexuality is okay. I'm like, what? Don't get me started. Now, you know, I'm, I'm all for... I'm all for... Love, the love and the grace of God. I preach love and the grace of God all day long, but you got to understand what put Jesus on the cross. That's sin. And we have to admit that we're sinners, and we have to agree with God about what sin is. And then we can receive the remission that we all so long for, the forgiveness that we all so long for, and that we need.
Verse 49, And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. So what's the power for? To be witnesses, not just to go witnessing, but to actually live a life that, that professes, that shows what you believe in is real. And that's the problem with Christianity. A lot of people walking around saying they believe, but they live their life like everybody else. You know? To be a witness, the power is to live it. To communicate the message, of course, but the power is mostly to live a life of repentance and, and people see that God sent your sins away. And God gives this power, his spirit, when we believe. The Bible says we're all baptized into the same spirit. The, here he tells them, okay, so they're believers, but tarry till you become clothed with power from on high. Every believer, once you believe, is made to drink of one spirit, the Bible says. For by one spirit are we all baptized into what? One body. The moment we believe, we're indwelt with this spirit of the Lord, and that's the, where we, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. We're adopted, you could say. Now, the Old Testament prophets, they were anointed. That's why when you say, hey, man, that was an anointed sermon, or that person's anointed, the idea is they're clothed with power for a specific task that God gave them. In the New Testament, we have the same thing of being empowered, and we're told to pray for that power. Acts chapter 2, it says they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, right? And they spoke in tongues. In Acts chapter 4, it says the building shakes, and they were all filled with the Spirit again. Well, I thought they were just filled. It means that they need to be refilled. Ephesians 5.18 says this, And be not drunk with wine where is in excess, but be ye, the tenses are, being filled with the Holy Ghost. So we want to continually be filled with who God is, and we need to pray for that. Jesus would say, you need to pray for the Spirit. How much more will the Father give those the Spirit to those that ask? So you have to ask for this. Let me tell you something. All ministry, you cannot do ministry for the Lord without the Spirit without praying for the Spirit. It is the one thing that is needed. It is impossible to be a minister. I see a lot of ministers that have a lot of education. I don't have much. Only I went to Bible school just to meet my wife, so I don't have a lot of education <laughs> when it comes to the Bible. But I can tell you this. I spent hours in a park every day at my job site praying, Lord, whatever you want to do with my life, use me. And I started teaching in Sunday school because I just felt that God, when I was reading books continually. I went, why are you downloading all this information in my head? I had no idea what he had for me, but I can tell you this, if you pray in the Spirit, he will open up doors for you and empower you to do things that you never ever would have done or felt comfortable doing. God is mighty like that. The Bible says you're all able ministers of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You have the ability to live in this world filled with the Spirit so that you can affect other people for good. That's our job. That's our job. Our job isn't to build big churches and to, to have big suits and to run around and act like we write books. No, nothing got nothing to do with that. It's got to do with introducing people to Jesus so that they can repent of their sin and have them sent away and they can go to heaven for eternity. Now, Moody would say this. Moody would say, they say, why do you always pray for the Holy Spirit? He says, because I leak. I need more. And I know you need more. Understand this too. When it comes to the Holy Spirit, there's 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 problems with it because it's sad that talking about the Holy Spirit is so divisive in the church today. It shouldn't bring division but unity. The Spirit brings love and unity wherever, wherever it is. That's why when I look at this church and I see all different kinds of races and nationalities, I know we're on the right track. I know we're on the right track. So avoid excesses, which is phony people saying God told me this or God told me that with no Bible behind it. Leave them. Because they're only into experience, and their experiences are what they want it to be, and it's manipulative. If anybody uses the Holy Spirit to manipulate people, woe to them. Because they got a greater judgment than me thinking about anything about them. I'm not going to judge anything before the time. But don't come to me either and ask, say, where should I go for this job? Or kind of where should I do this? Or how should I do that? I, God has your address and phone number. If it's biblical, I will tell you if you're out of the way. I can tell you what sin is, and I can tell you where a problem might be arising because there's sin in your life or there's something like that. That's easy stuff. But when it comes to picking a career or who to marry, don't ask me. God has your address and phone number. He can talk to you. We don't need a priest anymore. Can I get an amen? amen. Because there's a lot of people out there that want to stand between you and God and take your money on the way. That's not what we're about here. We're about 
preaching the kingdom of God. We're about seeing souls saved. We're about the Holy Spirit moving in a natural way. But don't be closed off to the Spirit either. I've had times where the Holy Spirit has given me a word of knowledge on somebody. And it's bothered me. And I never went to the person or talked to them. The reason why I got it, God told me, is to pray for that person. I never told anybody about some of the things I, 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 I thought about somebody. Because I don't know if it's true or not. But I do know this. If God's given me something, it's to pray for that person. And many times I'll walk up a month later and say, yeah, I was going through something back before God really spoke to my heart. And then I'm happy. Nobody has to, the spirit of God is there to, to bring unity together, to show the love of Christ for each one. It, it, it's got nothing to do with you. If, the, if you're taking the things of the spirit of God and showing off with them, speaking in tongues or acting like you're important or calling yourself a bishop or a prophetess, then you've got issues. What you need to do is use the Holy Spirit for the, for the furtherance of the kingdom of God and not yourself. It's very important. So avoid excess. Avoid people that bark like dogs or run around like nuts. Don't do that. But don't be closed off either to it. Ask, seek, and knock. Verse 50 to 53, and we'll close. He led them out as far as to Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. And it came to pass. Don't worry, we're almost done. I went off on the Holy Spirit a little bit. And it came to pass, while he blessed them, he was parted from them, he, he departed from them, and was carried up into heaven. And they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple, praising and blessing God. Amen. So they stay there, they praise God, they bless in Jesus. It says in Acts 1, let me read that for you. Acts chapter 1, verse 9, this is what happened. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? The same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go. This same Jesus. Bethany is on the Mount of Olives. Zechariah 14.4 says this. Jesus Christ will return to this very mountain, and his feet shall stand in that day. Upon the Mount of Olives, see, the angels know the scripture, which is before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west, and there shall be a very great valley. And half of the mountain shall remove toward the north and half towards the south. So Jesus Christ will return exactly the way he left, physically, visibly return to this earth. And the Bible talks of two resurrections in the Bible. The Bible says this, Jesus says this, John chapter 5, verse 28, marvel not at this, don't be shocked, for the hour is coming into which all that are in the graves, when it says all, it means all that are in the graves shall hear his voice and shall come forth. They that have done good under the resurrection of life and they that have done evil under the resurrection of damnation. The resurrection of life involves all those who've trusted in Jesus and repented of their sins and had them sent away and belong to him. They're born again by the Spirit of God. And that has several stages. The first fruits, when Jesus rose from the dead, the rapture that's coming. All will enjoy life with Jesus forever. The second resurrection involves all those that thought this stuff was nonsense. And I'm going to read that for you so you'll understand this happens after the millennial kingdom of jesus all the graves will be open it says in revelation chapter 20 verse 11 and i saw a great white throne and him that sat on it from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away and there was found no place for them and i saw the dead small and great stand before god they're all rising in his courtroom and the books were open and another book was open which is the book of life and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. You never want to be judged by your works. You want to be, you want to be forgiven by the cross of Jesus Christ. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and the death and hell were delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every man according to their works, and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So there's only two destinies and two paths. The kingdom of God will be restored. Will you be in it? The choice is yours as to what resurrection you want to be a part of.